It's often been said that Walt Disney considered this scene from Cinderella his all-time favourite animated sequence. This scene's animator once noted, It's not because of my animation. This scene represents Walt's philosophy that good things can happen, that your dreams can come true. And for Walt and the studio in 1950, Cinderella was a dream come true after an eight-year hiatus from full-length features. But this animator, with his own style, was just one of nine supervising animators assigned to Cinderella. They were the nine old men, combining their individual styles, ideas and minute gestures to create a 75-minute display of collaborative animation excellence. Named after Franklin Roosevelt's jab at the Supreme Court, Walt's nine old men were far from old at the time, but each of them had already strongly established themselves within the studio. Back in 1925, Walt Disney found Les Clark working part-time at a candy store near the studios. Two years later, straight out of school, Les began working at Disney, moving up and eventually replacing the great Arb Iwerks as Mickey's lead animator. But with Cinderella, Les was out of his comfort zone, sharing responsibility for Cinderella herself. Throughout the feature, many characters are drawn from a live-action reference to help create a realistic, subtle and overall elegant effect. But while some may appreciate the guidance the reference might provide, Les found it a distraction from creative expression. After all, I suppose it would be frightfully dull and, and, and boring and, and completely... Stick too close to the reference and the subject will lack personality and an emotional core best projected by animation. Les Clark enhanced the sincerity of Cinderella's expressions with important detours from the live-action reference. Eric Larson was looking for a career in journalism when he grew a taste for drawing and came to Disney in the early 1930s. Eric had such a wide breadth of skills from wild exaggeration in some characters to the subtle realism in others. For Cinderella, his vision was simple and understated with a youthful quality to her movements and expressions. He paid close attention to her hair. With just a few lines from which to work, Eric very slightly exaggerated the hair's movement, swinging it further as her head turns. Later in a lecture to young animators, Eric explained that animation is a form of communication, and therefore when you're animating you are making a statement, a statement about the character. If you don't have feelings and emotions for your character, how can it even be possible for the audience to? While Eric focused on a simple, youthful warmth to Cinderella's design, her third collaborator, Mark Davis, had a different perspective. Mark Davis joined Disney as an assistant animator for Snow White, working with the animal characters in Snow White too. Moving forward, he became best known for his strong animal character animation, but his skills didn't stop there. While Eric Larson was interested in Cinderella's youthful simplicity, Mark envisioned her as sophisticated and intelligent and sometimes even cynical. In the end, the two designs were combined to produce a fuller, more interesting personality as a whole. Mark also exhibited the more realistic animation style, important for a character like Cinderella who emotes so subtly throughout the feature. They're more difficult because the audience knows them better. We look at one another all the time. And uh, so these, we're very critical when we look at one another. So when you put a human character on the screen, all of those things are right in play. If it's a little animal and people aren't that familiar, they still will be accepted. But the human character, no. And of course, the dress transformation scene was Mark Davis's handiwork. Frank Thomas favoured observation above all things. I personally feel that you have to get out in the world and see people. You have to observe people. You have to watch what's going on and see to know, to know what's funny about them. Animating Lady Tremaine, Frank drew from live-action reference of the voice actress Eleanor Audley's performance. But expanding on the reference, he animated those slight pauses in her face, holding the frame just long enough to feel the tension in her expression. This lingering face shows the audience that it matters. It's not a passing motion, it's her personality, her soul. You'd go into his office and he would be searching for ways to communicate to you what, what he was trying to put into the scene. There was always some depth to the character he was trying to get. This kind of animation can't be achieved with a simple trace from live action. It comes out of the brief exaggeration from reality, from Frank's imagination and a lifetime of watching mean glares. 
a lifetime shared with best friend and fellow animator Ollie Johnston. Early on at Disney, Ollie Johnston became assistant to veteran animator Fred Moore. Soon after, he had an important role in the animation of iconic characters like Pinocchio and Bambi. On a feature like Cinderella, with such a variety of animation styles, the two stepsisters sit neatly in between realism and exaggeration. To be truly ugly sisters, their gestures and facial expressions had to be realistic enough to believe, but ridiculous enough to make you cringe at the sight of them. But instead of just making them purely ugly, Ollie focused on the comedy aspect. He was even instructed by Walt himself to tone down the ugly for one particular scene. My daughters, Drizella, Anastasia, you Grace. Back before his directing days, Willie crafted tense, thrilling sequences comparable to Hitchcock's greatest. Cinderella was no different, with the simplest settings being home to real cinematic action. Two mice, one key, and a towering spiral staircase. Giving the key and the constant brushes with the feet believable weight required a very particular direction. The frequent cuts to and from the action incited important anxiety and suspense in audiences. Ward Kimball was hired by Disney in 1934 at 20 years old, and by 23 he was rather tired of it all. Much of his work on The Seven Dwarfs didn't make it to the final cut, but to make up for it, Walt gave Ward the task of Jiminy Cricket, which of course he accepted. Ward was the animator that never grew up creating scenes as such, defying the expectations of reality with his work. When animating Lucifer, he strongly rejected the use of live action and anatomical reference, instead allowing the cat to move around free from realism. The movement is pure cartoon, it's playful and theatrical, true to the classic cat and mouse dynamic. With an impossible feline anatomy, so much more can be achieved in the movements. Bring this to the playful cat and mouse sequences with Jack and Gus, made for truly memorable gestures. Fellow animator Milt Carl later said, I could never have done anything like that. Hailed today as the animation Michelangelo, Milt Carl orchestrated some of the finest scenes of the golden age. Like Michelangelo, Milt's talents were varied and plenty and he knew it. He was confident in his craft to near arrogance. But his work spoke volumes for his words. He mastered the mix of straight and curved line work, the precise details in characters' hands, and the monumental task of animating personality in the princes. Milt said, never underestimate the benefit of props. And he reflected this in his work on Cinderella. The Grand Duke toys with his monocle while the fairy godmother twiddles her wand, and the subtle flares of personality emerge just as we see such delicate handwork. Perhaps the most underrepresented of the nine old men, John favoured broad, expressive characters over the subtle human form. He excelled in the shared rhythm and timing of animation and music, and was able to adapt to so many styles and speeds. Sequences with Jack and Gus show how faultless and clever John's animation was. The pace of the mice next to the weight of the cat create an electric dialogue between them. During the transformation sequences, he uses the music to time the animation right with the frame. John was a patient, timid man with a bold and varied portfolio of work. In many ways, he was completely different to Milt Carl. Yes, both were true masters of animation who left the studio prematurely, but Milt left in 1977 for his out often outspoken and antagonistic opinion, while John suffered an untimely death a year earlier. Milt was bursting with self-confidence, while a self-deprecating John considered himself fortunate enough just to continue learning, saying, I just worked hard and kept trying to become a good animator. And the hard work paid off. The film was a huge success, allowing the studio to finance several more features throughout the 50s, as well as beginning development on the Florida project, later named Walt Disney World. To have such a distinct combination of styles and personalities lay this foundation, build up the bricks and furnish the body of an animated classic like Cinderella is a risk Disney Studios were desperate to take. The initial goal was to create a new fairy tale feature with a familiar feeling and success that Snow White brought. What Cinderella brought instead was a creative cavalcade of the fantastic and the realistic, the traditional and the modern, pieced together by nine animators. 
some assigned to roles they were born to take, and some thrust with new challenges that would make them reevaluate the animation process altogether. To a worldwide audience, the film was Cinderella, but for Walt and the world of animation, it was the nine old men Les, Eric, Mark, Frank, Ollie, Woolly, Ward, Milt, and John. Hi, this is uh, Disney in Honesty. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I've been away for a while, but I'm back again with some new video essays uh, uh, all about Disney and its many formats uh, in, in philosophy and in storytelling and production and uh, any form of analysis that helps me best express how uh, fantastic Disney's feature animation lineup is. If you particularly enjoyed this video, then please uh, subscribe and like this and share it with all your Disney lover friends and hopefully you'll know a little bit more than you did about the Cinderella and about Disney's animation team back in the golden age. If you would like to get a bit more involved in Disney Honesty, I have a Patreon page which is linked right below me, uh, which is filled with all the quirks and perks of being a Disney scholar. So come and join. Here are a few uh, of the wonderful people who have been helping uh, keep this going. So thanks so much everyone from that lot and uh, thanks for watching.